Thanks, Mandy.
Well, folks, good morning. A really warm welcome uh, here to Burkhead Free Church. Uh, my name is uh, Peter. Um, I'm the minister here, if we've not met. And um, welcome to you here in the building. Welcome to you at home as well, watching on Facebook Live. It's great to have you with us. And uh, if you are at home, you might like to um, get hold of a service sheet for this service. You can get that at burkheadfreechurch.org forward slash Sunday service. Having said that, if you are in the building or at home, you don't need that because everything you need will be on the screen for you to follow. Um, Today we're continuing the the series that we've been doing uh, going through Luke's Gospel, which is one of the eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life. Um, But if you're here or watching for the first time, um, no prior knowledge is assumed, so you can fit in with us as we carry on. Um, As I always say now, book again for next week. Um, book early if you can in the week so we know how many seats uh, to arrange in the building. Really grateful to Mandy who does the jigsaw puzzle every week of where we can all sit and keep our social distancing. Uh, One thing to mention about tonight which is to say that uh, we have one of our uh, monthly equip Sunday evenings. Um, This is an online only thing so uh, don't come to the building uh, but on Facebook live at six o'clock tonight And uh, we're thinking about this important question, mental health and the church. Um, How should we, as God's people, think about this issue? Um, How can we be a church that cares well um, for people with mental health struggles? That's an interview I recorded with Louise McMillan, um, who's a biblical counselor based in Edinburgh, and is is really, really well worth watching. It's about 25 minutes long, um, but worth your time tonight at 6 o'clock. I mentioned last week our two uh, Christmas projects. Uh, Thanks so much for all the offers of help that we have had. Um, We have all the helpers we need for this first project, Christmas at Home. Uh, So if you live in Burghead, through the door uh, of your home soon, uh, in the week beginning Monday the 14th, you should get a a lovely envelope that looks like this. Uh, It has in there uh, a little chocolate, which has just fallen out. Um, Also a little leaflet uh, called Christmas Hope in a COVID World. Um, Also, uh, a Christmas card uh, written from us here in the church. And inside the Christmas card is a CD, which has uh, a homemade, home-produced carol service. Christmas carols to sing along with, if you want, readings from the Bible, and a short thought from me. And and if, like me, you don't do CDs anymore, um, there's also a QR code which takes you to a digital download of all the same stuff. So thanks to our volunteers who are going to stuff the envelopes and deliver those over the next two weeks. If you're in Burkhead, uh, watch out for that. We can't really invite you here for a carol service, so we're coming to you instead. Our second Christmas project is to give um, a hamper of Christmas goodies uh, to every family at Burkhead Primary School on free school meals. And again, thanks to all of you who've uh, given uh, money or um, have arranged to to give uh, things for those hampers. You can pass them on to Sue. Uh, Give us a wave, Sue. Um, uh, today or uh, in the coming uh, days and she can collect from you as well if that's helpful so speak to Sue about that and it's not too late if you did want to give uh, uh, financially to that project then you can do that as well in the usual ways just mark your donation Christmas hampers there's all kinds of other things happening as well that I won't mention just now but if you get the service sheet online then you can see a list of everything that's happening this week it will give you zoom codes for our online meetings uh, and all that sort of thing Enough notices from me. We're going to start with a a hymn of praise to God. It praises God um, for his grace to us, um, that God in his love can rescue any of us from our sin and draw us into his family. Uh, In the building, of course, we're not able to sing together, uh, but you can hum, and of course, at home, you can sing to your heart's content. So we are going to stand, so let's stand together as we sing.
great to have all the boys and girls with us. Every week we have a little thought for the boys and girls. And um, this week, if you look online, there is going to be a new catechism song to learn. So you can carry on with that online. Maybe mums and dads would find it for you on Facebook. We'll put it out this afternoon. But we're not doing that in our service today, partly because we have something else for you. This has been a year when lots of people have helped us in different ways. And so we're going to think about saying thank you. Who should we say thank you to for all the help we've had this year? Well, let's have a look. Here's the first one. Shop assistants. Do you know, people who work in shops worked all the way through the lockdown. They kept the shops open so that you and I could buy food to eat. Thank you to our shop assistants. We'll hang them on there. Next up. Ah, you knew this one was coming, didn't you? What is it? That's our medical staff. Uh, doctors and nurses and hospital assistants and hospital cleaners. All sorts of people who work in the NHS. We're so thankful that they kept on working and some of them had a really tough time as they were looking after people who were really sick and poorly. So thank you to our medical workers. We'll put them there. Next up. Ah, now you might think this is the most important one of all. That's our teachers. Now, us parents who had to homeschool our children for a few months, we are especially grateful for our teachers. We've learned what a tough job they have looking after you and teaching you all. So thank you, a big thank you, to all of our teachers. We'll hang them up here as well. But there's one more here on my pile. And right now, I think we are especially thankful to these people. Can you see what it is? This is the scientists who worked really hard and really quickly to get a vaccine for COVID-19. So that quite soon, probably next year sometime, lots of us can have a vaccine and hopefully that will mean that life can get us back to something a bit more normal. So we're really grateful to all the scientists who've made this possible. But of course it's Christmas time. And as someone who's not on our list here, but it is right to say thank you to him. And of course, Christmas is really all about him. And the last clue is this, the vaccine helps us to understand what he came to do. The last person, of course, and perhaps the most important, is Jesus. Christmas is all about Jesus. Now, I haven't got a decoration because I already have a star on the top of my tree. And you all know the star reminds us of Jesus because of the star that rested over the stable in Bethlehem where Jesus was born so many years ago. But how does a vaccine help us to understand Jesus? Well, what does a vaccine do? Well, the vaccine rescues us from the virus. You could say it that way. Uh, the virus is something that, that we could all catch, but the vaccine comes along to rescue us and to keep us safe. And boys and girls, Christians believe that the reason Jesus came at Christmas time was to do something sort of similar. Now, Jesus didn't come to rescue us from the virus called COVID-19, although he has helped us in lots of ways. No, no, Jesus came to do something even more important. He came to rescue us from our sin. That's what the Bible says. That's what Christians believe. Now, you might ask, what is sin? Well, when you spell the word sin, you will know it is s-i-n. Sin has a great big letter, i, or sometimes we call it i in the middle. Boys and girls, the Bible says that sin is when I live my way, my life, my way and ignore Jesus and God. And the Bible says that that's really serious. 
it's maybe even a little, little bit like a virus because sin is something that we've all caught and we all need a rescuer from it. Just like we all need a rescue from the virus of COVID-19. So Jesus came that first Christmas time, not just to be born, but to grow up and to live and to teach and to speak, but most of all to die. And Christians believe when he died on the cross, he came to rescue us from sin. Boys and girls, there's all kinds of people we should say thank you to at this time of the year. This year especially. Shop workers, medical staff, teachers, delivery drivers, scientists and vaccinators. But don't forget to say thank you to Jesus who came to rescue us all. Happy Christmas and see you soon. Well, that video is, is part of a video that we've uh, put together, which will go into the school um, as part of their uh, Christmas nativity this year. Boys and girls, you are going to head off to Sunday school. Let me just pray quickly before you do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. And we pray whatever our age, we would learn of him today. Learn of what he came to do and learn to love him more in his name. Amen. So, boys and girls, and... Uh, Parents, you can send your kids now. Abby and Keith are leading our Sunday school today, and they will lead them down um, to the hall. You're welcome to go with them and drop them off, or just send them off as you like. It's great to see them all. Some of them are walking now as well. Amazing. Well, folks, um, we who remain, we're going to continue with our, our service. Um, one of the things that we're working hard to try and do at the minute is to include members of our church family who are not able to be with us um, here today. We have a cap of 50. There are quite a number of folks who are watching online, um, some of them very much part of our church family. And uh, so we've got uh, two today who are going to lead us in prayer and then bring us our reading. Um, that is Gavin and Heather Thomas. Um, they're in Forest today, uh, but they'll be on the screen now. So first of all, Gavin will lead us in prayer. And then straight after that, you might like to find Luke chapter 15, uh, if you have a Bible, because Heather will read that for us. But of course, it will also be on the screen as well. So first of all, we're going to pray, and I'll hand over to Gavin. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, Every word in scripture points to the gift of hope that we have because of Christ Jesus. And as we begin this season of Advent, we are reminded that in the midst of our darkness, you are our greatest hope, bringing us peace to calm our anxious spirits and hectic lives. We look forward to celebrating the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ and are still amazed that even though we may wander away from you and turn our backs on you, you still search for us and love us so much that you sent your only son into a world full of sin not to condemn us, but that through him we can be saved. We thank you that he willingly gave his life in sacrifice for us, that we may be reconciled to you. And we thank you for the privilege of being able to approach you with our problems and requests, knowing that you hear us and will answer us. Turn our hearts again toward you. Make us ready to receive your Son, our Saviour. Father, we look around and see your wonderful creation, broken and in desperate need of your saving power and grace. Lord, in this time of anger, fear and doubt, come in love and mercy and restore your name again. Let peace on earth not be a hollow sentiment, but a real prayer in our hearts. We pray for all who preach this message this season and long that your truth will resonate within people's hearts and the true meaning of Christmas will not be lost in the busyness and commerciality that is so commonplace today. Lord, we bring before you our nation and governments and pray for all those you have placed in authority, that you would surround them with godly counsellors, that wisdom and discernment would rule in this time of anxiety and uncertainty. We take comfort in the fact that you are a sovereign God and rule over all the nations, and all things that come to pass are in accordance with your holy will. Father, we remember those for whom this time of year will bring heartache and sadness. We pray for those persecuted in the world and those displaced from their home. We remember those sleeping rough, the poor, the lonely, and the bereaved. Draw close to them, comfort and protect them. 
We bring before you those suffering, whether in body, mind or spirit. Again, we ask that you comfort them and give healing to them. We thank you for all the organisations that give selflessly at this time of year to help those in need and would ask that you would give us the loving heart of Jesus that we too may show compassion for those in need. We thank you for the blessing box and the hot meal deliveries and the opportunities to witness and share the good news of Jesus that these present. We pray that hearts will be touched and many will see the real meaning of the season. We ask your blessing on Peter as he speaks to us from your word. Lord, challenge our hearts and minds that we would know you more. We pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Luke, chapter 15, verses 1 to 32. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering round to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous people who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it she calls her friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms round him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the elder son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The elder brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I have been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. 
But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Well, folks, if you have that open in the Bible, keep it open, um, but it will be on the screen as well. Let me just pray again as we come to think about those words. Heavenly Father, as we gather today, you know our hearts. Um, You know the hurt and the anguish um, and the joy and the anxiety that's within each one of us. And more than that, Lord, you know where we stand before you. You know which of the characters in this story that we are like. And so, Lord, we pray that you would make it clear to us today where we stand with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, there are plenty of things about this year of COVID that have been hard. Not just the fear of illness, although there's that, of course, Um, Also the uncertainty, the disruption uh, to businesses and schools and colleges and universities and everything else. And then of course there are the economic costs, many of which are yet to come. The furlough scheme has been extended, but it can't last forever. And sadly many jobs will likely cease to exist come next March. But there is another significant cost as well. Um, This one's a cost that's hard to measure. Uh, This is the personal and relational cost. Uh, There's a relational cost to marriages that are going through the ringer because of all the stress and tension and the fact that we had to homeschool. And then there's the relational and personal cost caused by the horrific spike in domestic abuse. But there is another relational cost as well. And it is the cost of simply not seeing people. Being cut off from your closest friends and family in a way that no Zoom call can ever really replace. We don't, don't we, in many ways, that relationships are the most precious things we have. And so to be indefinitely separated from your loved ones feels excruciating. Now, some of us have lost dear ones uh, in this time of COVID. But for most of us, those separations are at least temporary. In one way or another, through one vaccine or another, we will be reunited with the friends and the family that we haven't been able to see. But some relational breakdowns are much more permanent and devastating than that. For example, there's the marriage or the friendship that goes down in a ball of flames as one party uh, leaves through a slammed door after an awful argument. Other times, relationships end in in a slower, in a colder way. People just seem to drift apart. And then one day they, they wake up and all the warmth and closeness has gone. Well, today we reach Luke chapter 15. We have been journeying with Jesus through Luke, exploring who he is and what he did and what he said. And most importantly, in the second half of Luke's gospel, that's from chapter 9, verse 51 onwards, we see that Jesus has set his face towards Jerusalem. He is heading there to the climax of the story, to the end point of his earthly life, which, of course, is his death on the cross. And last week we encountered a famous parable that Jesus told. Maybe the most famous story ever told, the Good Samaritan. And we discovered that far from it being a kind of moralistic tale that was only about the way we should behave, it was actually a story that pointed to Jesus himself, who is our Good Samaritan, who comes to rescue us and pays the costly price of rescue through his death on the cross. And if that was the most famous story ever told, I think you can make a good case for this one being the second most famous. 
We're focused on from verse 11 to verse 32. That is the tale of these two brothers. It is a story of broken relationships, but ultimately it's a story of our broken relationship with God. But as always, we can't just dive into a story without understanding the context. So here's our first heading. It's all about the, about the, con- about the context. Two banquets. What do I mean? Well, have a look at chapter 15, verse 1. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering round to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, that is the, the religious establishment, they muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And the question is begged, who has Jesus come for? It was unusual, to say the least, for a a rabbi, a holy man, to spend his time with the riffraff of society, with the sinners, with the morally and ritually unclean. But that is exactly what Jesus does. He's sitting down to banquet with sinners. And it doesn't go unnoticed by the religious establishment who take him to task for having table fellowship with these sorts of people. But the context to that is that Jesus has also just been teaching about another banquet, a second more significant banquet, the great banquet of heaven. That's back in chapter 14, verse 15 and following. So the question of who Jesus eats with is a loaded one. It's not just about who will eat their tuna sandwiches with Jesus here at lunchtime on earth. The real question behind the question is who will have fellowship with Jesus both now and in eternity? Who will find a place at the great banquet in the kingdom of God? Who will get a seat, not just at some earthly brunch, but at the heavenly banquet? Now the Pharisees, of course, think that they are all booked in for that heavenly banquet and that the sinners that Jesus is fraternizing with will most certainly not get a seat. And so Jesus tells them three parables to show them how wrong they are, to show them that Jesus has come to seek and save broken, sinful, lost people like you and me, and that that's who will get a seat in his kingdom and at his heavenly banquet. So the parables show us, first of all, that that Jesus is just like a shepherd. That's verses 3 to 7. A shepherd who goes after a lost sheep. Or, verses 8 to 10, he's just like a housewife who sweeps the place clean in order to find a precious coin that has been lost. The point is, God is in the business of rescuing the lost. And to really press home that point and make one or two other points... Jesus tells this third parable, the tale of two brothers. So, number two, two brothers. It's a family story, to state the obvious, about a father and two sons. And as Jesus, who really was the greatest storyteller ever, as he tells the story, it's very obvious that the father represents God. Now, I don't know what your view of God is here today. Maybe you think he's a hard taskmaster or a demanding tyrant. Jesus says, not at all. God is like a father, a father who loves his children. And whatever we have done and wherever we have been, he invites us back. Whether we have stormed out of relationship with God saying, I don't want to know you, God, or whether we've just drifted away, and become cold in all our religiosity. Jesus was prompted to tell the story, remember, because of the criticism from the religious establishment. So look back to chapter 15, verse 1, one more time. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So notice there are two groups of people around Jesus. You might like to call them the sinners and the saints, the sinners and the religious crowd. And what do you know? Of course, the two sons in the story represent these two groups. The younger son, well, he's like the tax collectors and sinners, the lowlifes of society. Today, I guess they'd be the drug dealers, the rip-off merchants, and the prostitutes. 
And the older son, well, he's like the saints, the respectable crowd, the religious crowd. I wonder today, as you hear the story, which are you? Jesus is inviting you to hear the story and find yourself in it. Where are you in this story? So, with those two groups in mind, Jesus sets out on his story, asking, can we identify ourselves in it? So first, there's the younger brother, the first son. Have a look at verse 11. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country. You can picture the scene, can't you? The younger son wants to cut loose. Dad, he says, you you know that life insurance policy you have? Well, I'd like my share now, thanks. I want my inheritance. But when do you normally get your inheritance? Well, normally it's when your dad dies. So here the son is effectively saying, Dad, I, I just wish you were dead. He's saying, Dad, I I just want your stuff. I want your benefits. I want the inheritance. I want the cash. I want the money. But I don't really want you. And that is the way so many of us treat God. We're, We're happy to live life in God's world, reaping his benefits and blessings, enjoying the good things he has made, breathing his air, but never giving God a thought And certainly not living a life of complete devotion to him as a son would for a father. So the son wants the father's stuff, but he doesn't want the father. And that is summed up so well in just two words. In verse 12, he says, give me. I think teenagers across the land are familiar with that phrase. Give me my stuff. Parents around the world know that that attitude is not right. And it's not right to treat God that way either. Give me. And so in this one devastating conversation, their relationship seems to be ended. He's like so many people who say, God, I don't need you. I want to run my own life, my own way. Get off my case. You're cramping my style. I don't like your rules, etc. And I reckon that the younger son as he walked away from the family home that day, would have felt great. Heading off down the driveway, he's got his back pocket bulging with cash, his share of the inheritance. He's cutting loose from the father's house and the father's rules. He's in charge now and he's going to have a good time. He's off for wild living, verse 13. No more of his dad's stupid rules and restrictions. He is free. And again, I hear so many people say that that, that that's what they want with God. If they even think he's there at all, they just want to be free of him. Free of a God who they think takes all the fun out of life, who's always telling them they shall not this and they shall not that. They want to be free. They think that will be better. And so off goes the younger son for sex and drugs and rock and roll. What many young men dream of. I mainly dreamt of the rock and roll bit when I was younger, but there you go. And he has great fun, for a time at least. It seemed great until the money dried up. Look at verse 14. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. Now, feeding pigs, that's a pretty mucky job. But we might think, well, at least it's a job. He could have done a lot worse. But remember, for a Jew who didn't eat pork, this is the most disgusting, most degrading job of all. It's hard to imagine, really, what would be the equivalent for us today. I couldn't really think of anything, but something that would really disgust you. Those are the depths to which this guy has sunk. And on top of it all, he's desperately hungry and desperately lonely. Once the money went, the younger son discovered that cruel truth that that the friends went as well and the parties and all the rest of it. So he's hungry and lonely and working a degrading job, but, verse 17, 
he came to his senses. This dreadful situation at least did something good for him. It brought him to his senses. I wonder how often do we look at a life which seems more wild and more fun and more free with jealousy. We think it looks great. The reality, of course, is very different. And maybe it's true that some folks have to hit rock bottom before they realize that life without God, the life they thought would bring such excitement and such freedom, actually isn't a life worth living. Certainly being destitute is a pretty loud wake-up call. And so he comes to his senses, he sees the mess he's made of life, and most importantly of all, he sees the mess he's made of his relationship with his father. And here's the thing, he began to see what he left behind with his father. Read again from verse 14. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country. He began to be in need. He went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to feed his pigs. Verse 17 now, when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And yet here I am starving to death. His lifestyle was literally killing him. And he thought of home, home where he was loved and accepted, home where even his father's employees were better off than him. And so he did something that is very difficult to do. He said, I'm going to go and say sorry. That's verse 18. I will set out and go back to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. And so the younger son, who used to live his life by two words, give me, now says two other words, I'm sorry. It's sad, so sad. Why can't we talk it over? Oh, it seems to me that sorry seems to be the hardest word. A bit of poetry there from Elton John. But it's true, isn't it? Sorry is hard to say. And yet sorry, well, that's how the Christian life begins and continues. The Christian life begins by coming to God and saying, I'm sorry, I've sinned. And anyway, the boy goes home, he, he rehearses his I'm sorry speech. You can imagine him psyching himself up as he walks back down the drive, practicing the words he'll say before turning up on the doorstep. He's not had any touch with the father since he left. Uh, he's lived this whole time without a thought of his dad, really. And of course, as he rehearses his speech, I guess he's not expecting a warm welcome from his father. But here's the heart of the story. From verse 18, Father, I have sinned against you, against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But read on. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. So far the story has focused on this younger son, but now the camera zooms in on the dad. Again, I don't know what your view of God is, but the father doesn't stand on the step, frowning, arms crossed, finger wagging, saying, this better be good, or I told you so. No, the father has been longing for this moment. In fact, the father runs, which was quite an undignified thing for the man of the house to do. But he runs towards his son and throws his arms around him and welcomes him. And did you notice the boy doesn't even have time to get all of his I'm sorry speech out. Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. That's only half the speech. And as if that weren't enough, the father then throws a great party. Verse 22, bring the best robe which was a sign of honor, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, which is a sign of authority and a place in the family, and sandals on his feet. That's a sign of being back in the family. The 
son is completely accepted. And, verse 23, bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and was found. So they began to celebrate. I wonder if you've grasped this about God. He is a good father. He does not treat us, as the psalm says, as our sins deserve. He is so generous, he rejoices to have us back, however far we've wandered from him. If you have run from God or been distant from God, the offer is there to come back and find unconditional acceptance. There is not a probation period. There is no purgatory. There's not a a moment where you have to prove yourself. No, no. The father accepts his children. Isn't it good? Not everyone thinks it's good. For some people, in fact, it makes them angry. We're on to the older brother now, verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing, so he called one of the servants and asked them what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home and you kill the fattened calf for him. The older brother is livid. How can the father treat the younger son like that? How can the father welcome him back? Here's the thing. Over the years, as I've explained the Christian faith to people, often at our Christianity Explored course, I have met many people who feel, well, kind of the same as this older brother does. They say to me something like this. Are you saying that whatever someone has done Whatever they've done, even if it's really terrible, like really terrible, you're saying that God will forgive them and have them back. You know, what about the murderer who repents? What about the terrorist who repents, they'll say? They hate it. And so does the older brother. But remember that the older brother represents the people back in verse 2, that is the religious people, the respectable people. Read again, verse 29. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. Do you see what he's saying about the father? Oh, and about himself. He's basically saying, well, I'm a good person. Well, I've never done anything wrong. I've not been off with the prostitutes. I've never been in trouble with the police. I've always worked hard. I've always paid my taxes. I'm a good citizen. And what has God ever done for me? Here's the real surprise in the story. The older son thinks he's an upstanding moral character. He's joined the family firm. He's worked hard. He's always around the father. And remember, the father in the story represents God. So I guess you could say, here's the sort of person you'd expect to find in church. He'd never miss a Sunday. On the outside, he looks very different from the younger brother. And that's true. He is different from the younger brother. But he's also nothing like the father either. You see the contrast? When the younger son returns, the father is glad, but the older brother is angry. The father greets him with open arms. The older brother meets him with clenched fists. The father embraces him as my son, but the older brother just calls him this son of yours can't even bring himself to call him brother. So you see, on the outside, this older brother looks like a model of unselfishness, but really, when his guard slips, you see the truth. In just one verse, he uses the word I, me, or mine four times. Here's a guy who is bound up with himself. He is self-righteous. 
He's near the Father all the time, but he doesn't have any love for the Father. And that's how it can be with people who see themselves as respectable, even religious. They might look very nice on the outside, but don't have any real love for God on the inside. They don't have an ongoing, loving relationship with their Father. Now, please don't hear me wrong. Being in church is good. It is very good. In fact, God tells us not to give up meeting together. This is a a key thing we do to encourage each other from the scriptures to meet with God, to, to worship him. But there is a kind of empty religiosity which looks like the older brother but doesn't really love the father and so do you see on the outside these two brothers could not have looked more different but on the inside both of them had actually broken relationship with the father now I don't know everyone here in the building today completely I certainly don't know everyone at home who's watching today completely maybe some of you have run a mile from God and blatantly broken his law in wild living No doubt others of us seem quite respectable, but the Bible is saying that all of us, by nature, have broken our relationship with God. Both categories are miles away from a proper relationship with God. One has had an almighty row and stormed off, the other just grew cold and bitter and drifted away, but both are miles away. And just as the younger son is welcomed back by the father who goes outside to greet him, did you notice as well, verse 28, the older brother became angry and refused to go in, so his father went out and pleaded with him. Again, there's the graciousness of God, do you see? So as we come to an end, the question is obvious, really. What what about you and me? Jesus tells the story, but he wants us to find our place in it. Where are you with God? Are you miles off in a pigsty? Or are you standing just outside the door in cold religiosity? The point of the story is that both types need to come to their senses, to our senses. The point of the story is that God offers his grace to both. The Father goes out to both to invite both back into relationship with him. Do you see his grace? Now you might ask, of course, how does this work? Well, don't forget chapter 9, verse 51. Where is Jesus heading as he tells this story? He's heading to the cross. What will he do there? He'll go to die. Why? To pay for sin. You might say, does this wild living with prostitutes not matter? Is it not wrong? Yes, it does matter. Yes, it is wrong. How can the Father forgive? Because Jesus has paid. He has stood in our place and died our death. He has gone to the cross for us. So that God the Father may open his arms to you and extend the invitation to come home. Let's pray, shall we? Maybe just have a moment of uh, quiet reflection. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this wonderful picture of your character that we see here. Lord, we know that you're not a God who delights in sin. But we thank you that you are also a God who has shown your love and grace by sending your son to pay for sin. Father, we pray for each person here today and those watching online. Lord, we pray for any who are yet to return to you, the Father. Lord, we pray that Today would be the day when they would see their need, the need we all have, and come back to you. And Lord, for those of us who are walking with Jesus, 
Forgive us when we forget or distort your character. Forgive us when we are tempted to become like the older brother in a kind of cold religiosity. Give us, Lord, a love for you, for your character, and for this good, good news of the gospel. Help us to be those who know it and love it and speak of it and share it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, folks. We are going to uh, sing or hum um, as we end. Uh, these are some words from uh, one of the Psalms. It's our tradition here to sing uh, the Psalms, which are the songbook of the Bible. And we love to do that. And because the main thing is not music but singing, we, we often sing unaccompanied, which is what we're going to do now. Or you're going to hum unaccompanied at least. These words from Psalm 32, how blessed the one who has received forgiveness for his sin. Uh, we'll stand again as we sing. How blessed the one who has received forgiveness for his sin, whose sins are covered from God's face, whose debt is cancelled in God's grace. There's no deceit in him. When I kept silent all my bones with groaning were worn out beneath your hand I felt entrapped both day and night my strength was sapped as in a summer drought. Then I laid bare my sin to you, the guilt that lay within. I said, O oh Lord, I have transgressed, and you forgave when I confessed. You pardoned all my sin. So let the godly pray to you while you are to be found surely when waves are sweeping past and mighty waters rising fast you keep them safe and sound let's remain standing for a final prayer and may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Please do sit. Folks, again, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for joining us online as well. Um, thanks to all of you who are serving so hard in different ways. And particularly, again, just a great thanks to the tech team. Um, who allow us to do this and the online thing. Um, we really appreciate your work. See you soon.